Next up on the broadcast, two hot button issues in Alabama right now, pension reform and Medicaid expansion. We'll talk about some research that the Alabama Policy Institute has done into both of these subjects with the vice president of this group, Catherine Robertson. Catherine, welcome to Capital Journal. Thanks, Don, for having me. Nice to see you. Uh, before we begin, I want to tell the folks a little bit about uh, API, the Alabama Policy Institute. You're a conservative think tank based in Birmingham. Elaborate for the folks on what That's you That's right. API was founded in 1989, so this is our 26th year. Um, we do research and analysis on really any major policy issue that the state is facing, um, anything from fiscal type issues, budget related, we've worked on prison reform, education, and so we just try to deliver our findings to the legislature to help them uh, choose a good path forward for the state. And the legislature tends to listen a lot to what you have to say. I know they seek your advice sometimes in some of these they issues. They do. We've got some great relationships with our legislators, um, not just the ones that are around our office in Birmingham, but really throughout the state. And, um, you know, every day that they're here, I'm here trying to assist and, and guide them the best way we can. Let's begin with pension reform, Catherine. Now, for the average citizen, this can be sort of a muddled issue, and I want to make it as simple. Uh, as possible. There's an ongoing effort now to bring about pension reform in this state. The legislature has created a committee on public pensions and uh, one of the goals is to bring into check, uh, if you will, our underfunded pension program. The legislature has to contribute uh, to the uh, state pension program to the tune of about a billion dollars a year because it's underfunded. That's right. So I think a, a big reason that pension reform is has really kind of come to the forefront right now is because we just spent seven months debating a budget shortfall in the general fund, which was about $200 million. You know, they were looking everywhere to try to find ways to save money here and there, cut back here and there. Um, but, but really, there needed to be a deeper look at really the drivers of the shortfall and where we're spending the most money. Um, and so pension reform as well as Medicaid kind of came to the forefront naturally through that process. Um, when you look at our state budgets, the Education Trust Fund and the General Fund, there's not a single line item for retirement benefits or anything like that. You know, they're listed under each agency's line item. But altogether, in the aggregate, um, we sent RSA about $940 million this year. It's projected to go up to about $970 million next year. And so um, clearly, it's an issue that we need to look at. Um, we need to try to cap the amount of money that we're sending year after year. And so the, the task force has been looking at some structural reforms we could do to the retirement plans of future state employees to try to get that underfunding at, uh, under control. Now, explain for the audience, if you will, what we mean when we say underfunded. So the pension system, um, RSA has a certain amount of assets and they have a certain amount of liabilities. And right now, the difference between our assets and our liabilities is about $15.2 billion. So that meant that if we needed to pay out that number of benefits right now of our liabilities, we would be short about $15.2 billion. And every time that unfunded liability increases, our annual contribution to RSA increases. So that $15 billion, we, we're paying that off each year when we contribute that amount. And so that, um, that amount goes up every time our pension debt goes up. Uh, that goes into, does it not, the debate that's raised for a few years over how good uh, the RSA investments uh, are paying off because one sector tends to blame that for the other. Right. There is a lot of talk about RSA's investments and, you know, whether in-state or out-of-state's good and all such as that. But I think that really when you look at pension systems nationally, you know, they're all in a little bit of trouble. Um, our pension system, our three different funds are under, under the national average. We're at about you know, roughly 65, 66% funded. The national average is about 72%. You know, the problem is, is the market is not doing well right now. So it's not just an Alabama specific problem. It's the kind of plans we're in, the defined benefit plan. And a traditional defined benefit plan really goes up and down with market volatility. And so we, we feel that it's probably better to focus on, sort of on the policies behind the structure of our pension plan rather than sort of picking apart individual investments and their returns because really we're seeing this nationally. We mentioned that the legislature every year helps to contribute uh, to the uh, deficit, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, last year about 940 million dollars but 
It's interesting to point out that that's something that the legislature doesn't have to do, but it does because it wants to keep uh, the pension system uh, fluid, so to speak. That's exactly right. Um, that, that annual required contribution is also sometimes called the ARC. Um, is something that doesn't have to be paid every year. And our legislature has been very responsible and very faithful to do that. Uh, we do still have an unfunded liability as we've discussed, but if you look at states um, that have not been paying their ARC, Kentucky being one of them, I mean, their system was around 40% funded because their legislature had failed to make the ARC. So even though it's difficult, I think, to write that check every year when there's so many other priorities that are vying for funding, um, we would be much worse off if we hadn't been making that payment. Our goal is to see that payment decrease over time. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for the legislature uh, to make these sorts of appropriations. That's right. I mean, the legislature sits down just like any other household and has to fund things based on priority. And I think it's really difficult in a year like this where we've had a shortfall and we've gone to taxpayers to ask for more. It really is difficult to ask the taxpayers to contribute more because a lot of people in the private sector really don't even have as good of retirement benefits as some of our public public employees do. So it's a bit of a strange dynamic and uh, we think that over time taxpayers really aren't going to want to be called upon you know to, to pay a two billion dollar a year required contribution if that's what it comes to. So we're, we're looking to try to cap our unfunded liabilities so that we can pay that down not see it continue on the trajectory it's on which is up. You mentioned that uh, the legislative committee which is looking at pension reform is looking primarily at structural uh, reform but when we talk about reform period that tends to make people who are vested in the pension system uh, a little nervous. Right. Uh, they think that uh, they're going to lose benefits in the process. Uh, there was so much concern that the legislative committee uh, recently adopted a resolution to say specifically we're not not going to hurt your benefits. Right. That that is a great point. The the reforms that the committee will look at will only be for future state employees. So any legislation that's drafted will have an enactment date of say, you know, January 2017. Any employees hired after that time really um, state employees, current employees and current retirees really should see this as the legislature's attempt to ensure that we can keep the promises that have been made. Because right now, if our unfunded liability continues to go up and taxpayers are either called upon or funds are having to take, be taken away from another priority to pay out these benefits, those benefits really could be in jeopardy. So this is not, it will in no way affect what's been promised to them. Really, it will help ensure that we can keep those promises. Well, Catherine, when we talk about making structural changes, I know this, these can be deep waters uh, to wade into, but g give us an idea generally of some of the things we're talking about. Sure. So, again, the defined benefit plan is, is sort of what we've seen as the common denominator for underfunding across the state, and that's because you, you calculate um, your annual required contribution based on a formula that really depends on your investment returns. And if that rate of return is high, like 8%, that's really difficult to make, and so that's where the state has to kind of come in and make the difference up. Uh, there's a number of alternatives that other states have looked at uh, to move away from the defined benefit plan, again, only for new employees. Right. Um, the cash balance plan is one of those. It's a bit of a hybrid between the defined benefit plan that we have now and a 401k style defined contribution plan. But really, any alternative that we would consider there are a couple ways to do it, but the goal would be to reduce the risk that the state will incur additional unfunded liability. You could do that through a hybrid plan or you could do that through a straight 401k plan, but it's not so much cost savings as it is reducing the state's risk of continuing to grow that pension debt over time. In talking with members of the Legislative Committee, which is uh, looking at uh, reform, they're hoping to have some recommendations to make to the legislature in the upcoming regular session. Are you encouraged by what you hear? I think so. You know, they've been given um, a whole lot of information. As, as you said, I mean, pension reform is a very complex topic. Um, it requires a lot of extra study on their individual parts. Um, unlike, you know, some issues that come that are sort of common knowledge, this isn't one. 
Um, but the committee has been very attentive. I think they really studied this on their own. And I think they all realize that something's got to change. I think they all realize that um, our unfunded liability has got to be capped. And exactly which way we go, I think they're still trying to figure that out, it seems. But I think they do realize that now is really the time for reform and that we need to get a handle on this. And also, very quickly, any reform that, uh, that does come about uh, will reap the benefits of over time. It won't be an immediate fix, right? That's right. It won't be an immediate fix, and that's why pension reform efforts are sometimes challenging because politicians like short-term wins that they can go home and sort of celebrate. But um, when you're talking pension reform, you're really always looking about 30 years out. But this is one of those long-term reforms that somebody has to step up and do it, or else it's going to be a problem for our children and grandchildren who are Alabamians and asked to pay taxes down the road. So it will be something that you don't really get to celebrate until a long time from now is a good thing from the state, but it really is a, a responsible thing to do and, and something that we really need. I want to turn to uh, Medicaid expansion. Now, this is not uh, a new idea uh, here in Montgomery. It's been pushed uh, by some for a number of years unsuccessfully to this point. Governor right. Bentley has been fairly resistant up until now, but uh, right. in the last couple of months, he said some things that have tantalized some by saying, we are looking at that. But when he says we're looking at that, that might not mean the same thing as some of the Medicaid expansion proponents might think. Sure. Well, you know, Governor Bentley ran on a platform of not expanding Medicaid. Um, his opponent, who he beat, uh, I think two to one, wanted to expand Medicaid. Um, so we, we re-elected Governor Bentley by a very large margin, and then he started sort of seeming to, you know, warm to the idea a little bit. Um, I, I know that there's pressure on governors to take the federal money. You know, people will argue that, you know, the federal government's giving out money. Why shouldn't we take it? You know, first of all, we're all federal taxpayers too, so that's reason enough to be concerned about our national debt, which is you know increasing by the minute. But even just from a state-based perspective, 37% um, of our general fund already goes to the Medicaid program that we have. And our Medicaid program, again, that we have without expansion is already increasing in cost so much. Um, we spent $685 million out of the general fund this year on Medicaid state dollars total, it was about $1.9 billion. And so when you look at Medicaid expansion and you, you think about the fact that um, a conservative estimate of you know 300,000 new people would be on this program, you really can't ignore the cost to the state. Certainly there's a federal match that tapers off over time, but if we can't afford the Medicaid program that we have, it's hard for me to see how we could you know, make a good argument for expanding it. For a lot of people, especially a lot of Republicans, uh, Medicaid expansion being attached to uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, has been a sticking point, so much so that Governor Bentley has put some other scenarios on the table, like, for instance, getting a, some sort of block grant right. to help fund our own expansion program. Right. We've seen that attempted by a few Republican governors um, and, and, and some Democratic governors to try to negotiate a deal with the federal government for expansion, but a, let's say a, a, you know, a state-based plan for expansion. So far, that's largely been unsuccessful. There are some governors who will say, you know, we negotiated and got a plan that was best for our state, but really the fine print is the exact same kind of Medicaid expansion that was presented under the Affordable Care Act. And in every scenario, they've had cost overruns and are really in kind of big financial trouble over it. You've even got states like Arkansas, which was once held out as a model for a state-based plan for Medicaid expansion, experience such severe cost overruns that they're trying to go back and figure out how they can fix it. So block grants for Medicaid would be fantastic. It's just that under the Affordable Care Act, we've not seen that be a reality. What about this waiver that Governor Bentley keeps talking about that we're trying to get from the federal government, which would help us in this arena? I, you know, I think that he's been um, negotiating our managed care reform for Medicaid that was passed a few years ago, and I think maybe he's hoping there's a way we can parlay that into some kind of Alabama-specific fix for Medicaid expansion. I'm not totally sure what his plans are there. But again, if you just look around at other states, it's just not worked. It sounds good, but the reality is that it's been very, very costly. Um, the number of enrollees has been much higher, and there has so far been no example of 
partial expansion. It's sort of a one-size-fits-all deal. So even if there is a little give and take between the federal government and the state, um, the actual eligibility is not negotiable. So it, it really turns out to be a full-blown expansion, no matter how you slice it. Is there any compromise on this issue? Because uh, there are those who continue to insist that we've got to get more Alabamians uh, insured. As a matter of fact, the governor's health care task force recently recommended to him that we need to work vigorously to get more Alabamians insured. It stopped short of actually saying we need to expand Medicaid, right. but uh, it said something's got to be done. There are a lot of free market reforms that other states have tried to improve health care access for people in their state. You know, the Policy Institute's position is that Medicaid's really designed to be a safety net for the truly poor and vulnerable. And if you overwhelm that system, health care outcomes really don't improve. So our thought would be, you know, competition drives down prices, kind of a basic uh, theory of economics. So, um, we, you know, we have certificate of need laws here that really restrict the healthcare industry. Um, you know, there are things you could do to um, increase access to care. For instance, there's a big push in some states to allow nurse practitioners to do some things that doctors do. That drives down the cost. Um, there are a lot of things like that that have been successful. Incentivizing charity care is another. So we would much rather see our state sort of be innovative in that regard than get sort of trapped in this federal program that we pretty much lose complete control over. As we get ready to close, you've already alluded to the movement to managed care mm -hmm. here in Alabama. Governor Bentley has said all along that he wouldn't even consider expanding Medicaid until we uh, reformed our own Medicaid system here in mm -hmm. Alabama. And one giant step in that direction, it is believed, is the uh, creation of these uh, regional care organizations and the movement toward a more managed care model. Right. Uh, that was a bill that was passed, I guess, about two years ago, but it's been a very slow implementation process. But the idea is, is that you sort of give each region a specific amount of money that you're going to spend, and there's an incentive to manage it well, to keep costs down, to encourage um, consistently good health care practices rather than so many emergency room visits. And it has proven to be a successful deal in other states. Ours has been sort of slow to kick in, but again, it may be one of those reforms that really has long-term benefits that you know we haven't been able to experience yet. I think it's a good step forward. I think there's some other opportunities we could probably see to, to make things a little more cost efficient in our system, but definitely a strong, a strong start. Catherine Robertson is vice president of the Alabama Policy Institute based in Birmingham. It was a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Don. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. And Capital Journal. We'll be right back.